Our final um, lecture today is by Stephen Russell, a, a postdoctoral student at um, Princeton Theological Seminary, who has done interesting work on the image of Egypt in the Hebrew Bible, and is going to talk about, I think, uh, Exodus chapter 18, something like that. Uh, yeah, Exodus 18. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I, I did a sort of first book on the Exodus, and I'd be happy to discuss that with anybody afterwards. Today, I hope to present something a little bit more uh, limited to Exodus chapter 18, but that I hope will illustrate the way in which the book uh, continued to be a living tradition that was edited and that evolved over time, some of the same themes that we've been taking up. According to Exodus 18, 13 through 27, on the advice of his Midianite father-in-law, Moses appointed a hierarchical system of commanders to judge legal cases. These appointed officials were to share his judicial authority by deciding minor legal cases and referring the hard cases to him. Through the tiered system of officials, direct access to the highest court was restricted so that the burden of Moses' caseload was made more manageable without compromising his unique position. A parallel account of the establishment of the judiciary is contained in Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18, and the texts are generally regarded as having a literary relationship to one another, with connections also to Numbers 11, 10 through 30, where Yahweh shares Moses' spirit with 70 of Israel's elders. Although Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is set in the period of desert wandering, scholars have generally understood the text as reflecting the social world of the monarchic period. Several located more specifically in the time of Jehoshaphat, who, according to 2 Chronicles 19, appointed local judges and established a high court in Jerusalem. According to this view, Exodus 18 was composed as an etiology for the system of royal judges attested in 2 Chronicles 19. I propose that the structure of the legal world envisioned by Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is much more closely parallel, paralleled by that assumed in Ezra 7, 12 through 26, where the Persian king Artaxerxes instructs Ezra to appoint judges who know the Mosaic law. As such, and in light of literary historical considerations, Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is best understood as a post-exilic expansion of Exodus 18 that drew on Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18. The exp expanded chapter 18 now serves as a major bridge in the book of Exodus by summarizing the deliverance from Egypt and anticipating the revelation at Sinai. A half century ago, Ralph Nearim put the traditional historical study of Exodus 18 on new footing. While an older generation had imagined various pre-monarchic traditions lying behind the narrative, Nearim uh, located this etiology of the judicial system firmly in the monarchic period. Jethro concludes his advice to Moses with the assurance that all the people will return to their place in peace. The reference to each Israelite having their own makom suggests a social setting after the settlement in the land. Nearim further narrowed the social setting of the text. Exodus 18, 13 through 27 betrays no anxiety over Moses' own authority, which is simply assumed. Rather, the text is concerned with transferring Moses' authority to other judges. In Nearim's view, neither clan elders nor priests of local shrines would have needed such an etiology, but only a newly appointed category of judge. He therefore saw the etiology's background in the changes to the judicial system attributed to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 19. Jehoshaphat, according to the text, recognized the traditional judicial system by establishing, sorry, reorganized the traditional judicial system by establishing a high court in Jerusalem and appointing local judges throughout the land. Nirim argued that Exodus 18, 13 through 27 was composed in order to lend Mosaic authority to these newly royally appointed judges. The theory, however, does not adequately explain several features of Exodus 18 and 2 Chronicles 19. Stephen Cook and Axel Grotner have offered a thoroughgoing critique of Nearim's work. Here I wish to highlight two shortcomings of his hypothesis that will form a backdrop to the alternative I am proposing. First, in my assessment, Nearim has overestimated the tension in 2 Chronicles 19 between centrally appointed royal judges and other forms of legal authority. 
The chapter portrays a judicial system that is composed of several overlapping and complementary power structures. Rather than a neat hierarchy of judges all having the same type of authority, there are interconnected roles for judges drawn from different sectors of society. By using the preposition min, verse 8 portrays Jehoshaphat as appointing to the central court some priests and Levites and some of the heads of the ancestors of Israel, apparently a term for a traditionally recognized leadership structure based on the language of kinship. Jehoshaphat reorganized, sorry, recognized their traditional authority. Furthermore, the judges that Jehoshaphat appointed in the cities of Judah could defer cases to the multi-partite central court. In other words, the narrative does not understand the royally appointed judges as operating independently of traditional forms of distributed authority held by clan leaders, priests, and Levites. Royal and traditional authority are portrayed as operating coherently within a single system. In Exodus 18, as I argue further below, juridical authority is portrayed as coming only from the top down with no connection to traditional forms of authority. In arguing that only royal judges required an etiology like Exodus 18, 13 through 27, Nehemiah has, in my assessment, overestimated the tension in 2 Chronicles 19 between different kinds of legal authority and has not fully come to terms with the exclusively top-down approach to authority in Exodus 18. A second difficulty with the hypothesis is its failure to account for the prominent role Moses' non-Israelite father-in-law plays in Exodus 18. In 2 Chronicles 19, the judicial reforms are initiated by Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, of the line of David. There is no hint in 2 Chronicles 19 that the appointment of local judges or the creation of a Jerusalem high court came as a result of foreign influence. Exodus 18, on the other hand, credits a foreigner with initiating the appointment of local judges. The father-in-law's foreignness, as I argue further below, is central to Exodus 18 and is not merely the result of the larger narrative frame. To my mind, even though one must surely abandon as historically implausible the theses of Gressman and Albright and Note, who saw behind the text one form of pre-monarchic encounter or another, a great strength of their analyses was their recognition of the startling nature of this foreign attribution. In understanding Exodus 18 as an etiology ascribing mosaic authority to royal judges, Nehemiah has, in my view, overestimated the role of Moses in the text and underestimated that of Moses' foreign father-in-law. I propose that in understanding judicial authority as coming only from a central leader, and in attributing the judicial system to a foreigner, Exodus 18, 13 through 27 reflects the same view of the structure of the legal world as does Ezra 7, 7, uh, 12 through 26. According to Exodus 18, a single leader, Moses, stands at the top of a single judicial hierarchy. Lower judges are appointed solely on the basis of Moses' authority. He chooses men of valor who fear God, men of truth who despise ill-gotten gain, as though the choice depended solely on individual character. There is no hint in the language used to describe these officials that they have any relationship to tr traditional structures of governance based on assumed, assumed kinship or to priestly or Levitical status. Rather, the judges are described in bureaucratic and military language as men of valor and as commanders, the latter term, in my view, being taken over from Deuteronomy chapter 1. Nor is there any room in the system for the existence of other judges who happen to go unmentioned here. According to verse 14, all the people go to Moses for judgment. And according to verse 22, every dispute is to be settled within the system as it is outlined in the chapter. A similar view of legal authority is reflected in Ezra 7. According to verse 25, Ezra is instructed to appoint judges and magistrates who know the laws of God. As with Exodus 18, the language used for these judges betrays no connection to traditional forms of authority. While priests and Levites are mentioned in verses 13 and 16, and a variety of temple officials in verse 24, the text does not assign them any judicial role. The exclusive legal authority of judges in Ezra 7, 12 through 26 is highlighted by a comparison to Ezra 10, where elders and centrally appointed judges jointly investigate the marriages of certain Israelites to foreigners. 
This picture of an ongoing role for traditional leadership based on the language of kinship is also found in Deuteronomy 1.15, where Moses confirms the authority of tribal heads. And in Numbers 11.24, where Yahweh places some of Moses' spirit on 70 of Israel's elders. In contrast, both Ezra 7 and Exodus 18 contain an idealized view of judicial power, which is imagined as emanating from a central authority without regard to traditional forms of authority held by elders, priests, or Levites. Both texts also credit a foreigner with the idea for a system of judges. In Ezra 7, 12 through 26, the command to establish a judicial system is given by Artaxerxes to Ezra in the form of an Aramaic letter. The identification of Artaxerxes as king of Persia in the narrative frame in verse one, and the fact that the letter is written in Aramaic rather than in Hebrew, both highlight the, the foreign character of the patriarchal figure who suggests the system of judges. Likewise, in Exodus 18, 13 through 27, the suggestion for a system of judges comes from a foreigner, Moses' father-in-law. The peculiarity of this arrangement is brought out by a comparison with the alternative tradition of the establishment of the judiciary in Deuteronomy 1. There, Moses himself was responsible for the devising the system of judges. He proposed it to the people who actively participated in the decisions. The text acknowledges the existence of foreigners and grants appointed judges some legal authority over resident aliens. But the system is designed and established exclusively by Israelites. In Exodus 18, on the other hand, the narrative has gone out of its way to reintroduce a long forgotten character, Moses' father-in-law and to attribute to him the idea for the system of judges. Furthermore, the foreignness of Moses' father-in-law is not merely the result of the larger narrative frame in which the story occurs. Rather, Exodus 18, 13 through 27 highlights the fact that the father-in-law is a non-Israelite by attributing to him idiosyncratic speech patterns. A careful examination of the father-in-law's speech shows that it contains a density of unusual morphological, syntactical, and lexical features. Mordecai Mishore points to several of these. The narrative frame uses the expression min haboker in verse 13 with a preservation of the known before a definite noun. Such usage is quite normal in standard biblical Hebrew. The father-in-law, however, uses min boker in verse 14 with a preservation of the known before an indefinite noun, a pattern that may go on to be more normal or at least more frequent in late biblical Hebrew. Uh, the, the verb naval, verse 18, is used 18 times in biblical poetry, but this is its only use in a prose context. In verse 18, the father-in-law uses the form osohu, where we might better expect osoto. The preposition mul, itself occurring only 26 times in the Bible, is used in connection with a deity only in Exodus 18, 19. In verse 20, the father-in-law uses the exceptionally rare ethem instead of the common form otam. In verse 20, he uses an asyndectic relative clause, which is rare, a rare construction in prose, except in the Book of Chronicles. The Hephel of Zahar, used in verse 20, may be an Aramaic loanword. In verse 21, the father-in-law also uses the verb haza with the meaning to choose, which is otherwise unattested in Biblical Hebrew. In verse 23, he uses the verb bo with the preposition al instead of the much more common el, which is used by Moses in verse 15. Individually, each of these features might be dismissed as having no particular significance, but taken together, they suggest a deliberate attempt on the part of the narrator to characterize, to characterize the father-in-law's speech as tilted, unusual, and foreign. Exodus 18, 13 through 27, and 7, 12 through 26, thus share two key perspectives that are not shared by any of the other texts usually considered in relation to the establishment of the judiciary. Deuteronomy 1, Numbers 11, and 1 Chronicles 19. At the same time, the texts do not have particularly strong linguistic connections at the level of shared phraseology and are in fact written in different languages. They do not come from the same scribal hand or school. Rather, they both reflect the same social milieu in which it was possible to imagine Israel's judicial system as being organized exclusively from the top down and as being initiated by a foreigner. Both texts, in my assessment, date from the post-exilic period, whether or not the system they envisioned was ever implemented. In the monarchic period, official bureaucratic structures of governance associated with the royal courts 
had always shared judicial and other forms of power with priestly groups and with traditional forms of leadership based on kinship, in particular town elders. They all functioned as part of a single system. It is only in the post-monarchic period, under the influence of the great empires and after the disruption of the traditional modes of life, that biblical scribes came to imagine an exclusively top-down approach to judicial governance like that presented in Exodus 18 and Ezra 7. It is in that period also that at least some circles sought to lend legitimacy to Israelite systems of law by associating them with foreign authorization. A post-exilic date for Exodus 18, 13 through 27, is compatible with linguistic, literary critical, and traditional historical considerations. A detailed discussion of the linguistic evidence for dating the text lies well beyond my aims here. Suffice it to say that in this short pericope, the majority of which is dialogue, and some of which is, in my view, copied from Deuteronomy 1, there is really insufficient linguistic data to characterize the text as being written in standard biblical Hebrew versus late biblical Hebrew. With regards to literary critical and traditional historical considerations, I limit myself here to brief observations on the relationship of Exodus 18, 13 through 27 to Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18 and Numbers 11. The relationship of Exodus 18, 13 through 27 to Exodus 18 as a whole, and the relationship of Exodus 18 to the structure of the book of Exodus. Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is widely regarded as containing thematic and linguistic similarities to Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18 and Numbers 11, 12 through 30. In, in my view, the connections to Numbers 11, 12 through 30 are not particularly strong. Although Exodus 18 and Numbers 11 are both interested in the nature of Moses' leadership, there is in Exodus 18 no sense that the appointed leaders will share in Moses' spirit, nor is there any sense that Numbers 11 has legal administration as one of its concerns. Rather, Numbers 11, 16 through 17, 24b through 30 share much more in common with Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18. At most, Exodus 18 and Numbers 11 share the root uh, to describe the, sorry, kaved to describe the essential problem being addressed. The responsibility is too heavy for Moses. But the root is too common in biblical Hebrew to serve as evidence of direct literary borrowing in one direction or another. In sum, the thematic and linguistic links between Numbers 11 and Exodus 18 are not particularly strong, and there is little reason to posit that one text is literarily dependent on the other. The connections between Exodus 18 and Deuteronomy 1 are much stronger. They share the same essential problem, the people are too many. And they share the same solution, Moses appoints a tiered structure of officials to carry out judicial functions. The literary connections between the texts are also quite strong. Both texts contain the phrase commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, and commanders of tens. In fact, between them, the two chapters share the only three references to this four-tiered structure of commanders in the Hebrew Bible. The extended phrase, however, sits equally awkwardly in both chapters in opposition to other noun phrases in their respective sentences. There is thus no syntactic reason for considering one phrase more natural to its context than the other. There is also a close resemblance between Exodus 18, 26, the hard matter they would take to Moses, and Deuteronomy 1, 17, the matter which is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, you shall bring near to me. Here also, there is no grammatical reason to posit one particular direction of dependence over the other. Thematic considerations, however, suggest that Deuteronomy 1 was the original text. John Van Seters notes that Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18 is explicable entirely on the basis of the Deuteronomic code. In Deuteronomy 6, 18 through 19, the people are commanded to appoint tribal judges and officials in every city gate and are charged with executing justice without partiality. According to Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 13, a legal case which is too baffling to judge may be, must be brought to a central court consisting of Levitical priests and a judge. Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18 can thus be explained as a Deuteronomic reflection on the themes of the Deuteronomic Code that retrojects legal structures and procedures from the Code back into the time of Moses himself. In contrast, Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is isolated thematically from its context. Outside of Exodus 18, 13 through 27 and a late gloss about the temporary delegation of legal authority to Aaron and her in Exodus 24, 14, the themes of legal administration that I have been discussing are not taken up directly in the book of Exodus, nor in the non-priestly material in the Pentateuch. 
In light of these considerations, I regard Exodus 18, 30, 20, 13 through 27 as literally dependent on Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18, which is in turn based on the themes of the Deuteronomic Code. Let us turn then to the relationship of Exodus 18, 13 through 27 to Exodus 18 as a whole. Form critics of Exodus 18 have viewed the narrative's structure as key to understanding its traditional historical background. The story's main events occur over two days with quite distinct activities on each. On day one, Jethro meets Moses in the desert, listens to all that Yahweh had done for Israel, and celebrates a feast to God. On day two, Moses' father-in-law observes Moses administering justice to all the people and recommends a new system of judicial administration which is adopted. In addition to the thematic differences between the two halves, there are important descriptions, differences in terminology. In verses 1 through 12, Jethro's name is used seven times, and the title father-in-law is used three times, somewhat interchangeably. In verses 13 through 27, however, the character is referred, only, is referred to only as Moses' father-in-law. The name Jethro does not appear. Likewise, the noun Elohim and the divine name Yahweh are both used in verses 1 through 12, while only Elohim appears in verses 13 through 27. Given these linguistic and thematic differences between verses 1 through 12 and 13 through 27, I agree with an older generation of form critic who understood the two halves of the chapter as having different traditional historical backgrounds. At the same time, the chapter reads sensibly as a whole. It opens with Jethro hearing all of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, and it closes with him departing for his home. Furthermore, verses 13 through 27 offers no explanation of how Moses' father-in-law re-enters the narrative after such a long absence. As such, verses 13 through 27 seem to assume the existence of verses 1 through 12. These seemingly contradictory observations are reconciled on the hypothesis that verses 13 through 27 are an expansion of verses 1 through 12. The expansion was based on material from Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18, but it reflected a fundamentally different view of the structure of legal administration than Deuteronomy chapter 1. Finally, I offer some brief observations on the relationship of Exodus 18 to the book of Exodus as a whole. E. Carpenter has shown that the chapter sits at a tr transitional point in the book. The first half of the chapter recapitulates the deliverance of the people from Egypt, narrated in the preceding chapters, while the second half anticipates the revelation of God's law from Sinai, as reported in the chapters that follow. The relationship of Exodus 18, 1 through 12 to the material that precedes can be refined further. Conrad Schmidt, drawing on the work of Erhard Bloom, has noted that the chapter has particular, particularly close affinities with Exodus 3 through 4. The name Jethro, the term mountain of God, the description of the Exodus as an act of God's goodness and as of his deliverance, and the use of the definite article with God, Elohim. For Schmidt, Exodus 18 belongs to a post-priestly redactional layer that included Exodus 3 to 4, a layer he dates to the early 5th century BCE. Setting aside the use of the definite article with God, which is too common in the Pentateuch to be diagnostic in and of itself, I would point out that the connections to Exodus 3 to 4 really occur only in verses 1 through 12. Exodus 18, 13 through 27 is linguistically and thematically quite different, as I have noted above. If Exodus 18, uh, 13 through 27 is an expansion of Exodus 18, 1 through 12, then it would date to a later period than Schmidt's post priestly irredactional layer. Exodus, 13, uh, sorry, Exodus 18, 13 through 27 looks forward to the revelation at Mount Sinai. Ed Greenstein has shown how the narrative has artfully deployed the light word davar, generally thing, word, matter, but used several times in Exodus 18 with the more narrow meaning legal case. In his view, it serves to introduce the motif of the words of Yahweh in chapters 19 through 34. As a prologue to the revelation at Sinai, Exodus 13 through 27 performs at least three functions. First, it addresses one major shortcoming of the covenant code, the lack of any mechanism for the implementation of the laws it contains. Second, it reminds the audience that although the revelation at Sinai in 34.16 included, included an injunction against marrying foreign women, even Moses himself, at the very genesis of the judicial system, had a foreign wife. Third, although Aaron and the elders of Israel play important leadership roles in Exodus 24, the prologue establishes the priority of another kind of judicial system. That system, like the one described in Ezra 7, Ezra 7, has a single hierarchy rooted in administrative language and was implemented on the advice of a foreigner. Thank you. <laughs>